Peter J. Pillis, worked at Pueblo Grande Museum from 1965 to 1967, then at the Museum of Northern Arizona from 67 until 75. He then became the archaeologist for the Coconino National Forest, and that's his present position. He's been an advisor to the National Park Service, the state of Arizona, the Museum of Northern Arizona, and the Brazilian Institute for Cultural Heritage. As an adjunct professor at Northern Arizona University, Peter has been an instructor in archaeological law enforcement for the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center there, and has taught courses in rock art conservation and management for a number of conferences and symposia in, in the United States, Brazil, and Argentina. He's also served on the Board of Trustees for the Museum of Northern Arizona. Peter has presented over 70 papers and authored 50 publications. His most recent publications coming out this year are The Crane Site and V Bar V Ranch, co-authored with Ken Zoll, one of our new board members, and The Legacy of New Deal Programs to the Archaeology of Northern Arizona, and that's co-authored co with Gene Stevens. So not only does Peter have a busy career, but he has provided much support to ARC and HIS and will be working with us again next year to do a, another field trip for our members. So thank you, Peter, for all you've done. And without further ado, I'd like to welcome Peter Pillis. Thank you, Fran. Well, tonight's presentation developed out of a Society for American Archaeology meeting a number of years ago, where uh, a number of archaeologists got together to discuss the legacy of New Deal programs in the Western United States. Um, that met with a great, great acclaim by many people. And the idea was presented to, why don't we publish these in a paper or a, a book? And that took about two years or so to get off the ground, but it finally did. And I'm happy to say that that is supposed to be issued by the University of Utah Press either next month or in July. So if you really like this and want to learn more about the New Deal in this Western United States, I encourage you to you know, take a look at that. But the Depression began in 1933 uh, and was a tremendous uh, event in American history. A quarter of the nation's loss of workforce was lost. A quarter million families defaulted on their mortgages. Shanty town sprang up. Banks failed. Uh, dams broke. Farm foreclosures. Uh, it was a really bad time in, in the history of the country. There we go. And then we elected uh, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, uh, who's well noted for all of the accomplishments he made in his very first 100 days in office. Obviously, you know, his main plan was to get America back to work, uh, to get money back in the hands of people, provide for the sick, and to get industry back on its feet. And so he very quickly uh, came in with the, his advisors and formed any number of federal works projects, starting with the Federal Emergency Relief Administration, and the more well-known ones would be the Civilian Conservation Corps, and later the Works Progress Administration. What many people aren't aware of is that during the CCC, there was a separate division for Native Americans called the Indian Division, and much of the work in the Southwest was, was done by Native American people. And the program was administered by uh, the main person of the National Park Service in the Southwest, uh, Frank, also known as Boss Pinkley. He was known as Boss because he ruled with a, a firm fist, firm hand. He had definite ideas about how he wanted interpretation in the parks and monuments to be, uh, and felt that the monuments had often received short shrift in terms of funding but he realized the great potential of America's archeological sites and natural areas to be of interest and in, in, uh, for the American public. So with Pinkley in charge, uh, the programs were also parceled out to a number of different agencies and individuals. Um, Dr. Emil Howery at the Arizona State Museum, University of Arizona uh, was in charge of, of all those programs, assisted by you know, his ex-student, uh, Frank Lassiter, Roy Lassiter, I'm sorry. Uh, and at that time, the main institutions in Arizona was the Museum of Northern Arizona, uh, Pueblo Grande Museum, the Arizona State Museum, and, um, well, those, those four institutions for it. Um, what was helpful is that most of these institutions already had standing programs in archaeology, 
and specialized in specific parts of the state. Uh, and so as in most archeological activities, uh, we can always use money because we don't get money to really do all the, all the work we'd like to do. And so as the federal money became available to make jobs for people, this was a godsend to those institutions that already had research interest and already knew what they wanted to do uh, when they had the chance. So as I mentioned, the, the main players involved was Pueblo Grande Museum headed by Odd Halseth. Uh, Halseth was a, a Norwegian who came and uh, directed activities and excavations at Pueblo Grande Museum for many years. Uh, Arizona State Museum was represented by Dr. Byron Cummings, uh, who already had a, an illustrious career in the Southwest um, and trained many of the students that went on in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s to make major contributions to Southwest archaeology. Okay. Gila Pueblo uh, was a private research institution uh, run by Dr. Harold S. Gladwin. Uh, his staff consisted at one point of Dr. Amel Howry uh, and uh, other archeologists who would, as I said, make many contributions for it. Um, one of his, some of his main uh, associates was uh, Erwin Hayden and his son, Julian Hayden, who those of you in Tucson, I'm sure are very, very familiar with. The Museum of Northern Arizona in Flagstaff is also a private uh, research institution started by Dr. Harold S. Colton. Um, he, he was originally a, trained as a zoologist who taught at the University of Pennsylvania, but he became entranced with the Southwest, uh, Arizona in particular, and moved here in uh, the 1920s uh, with his wife, Mary Russell Farrell Colton. Uh, together, they uh, developed the Museum of Northern Arizona and hired a staff of a very bright young archeologists at the time. And Colton's work you know, uh, came up with many of the major concepts of Northern, the Northern Southwest prehistory. A total of 16 projects um, were done under the administrations of the federal government uh, in, in the Northern Arizona area. One of the earliest ones was at Tuzigut. Uh, Tuzigut is a large uh, uh, Pueblo attributed to the Southern Sanawa people dating from around 1150 to 1400 AD. Uh, it's a, the, considered the type site of the last stages of the Southern Sanawa uh, culture. Uh, excavations began in 1930, 30, 1933 um, and was really uh, encouraged by the Afipai County Chamber of Archaeology Committee, uh, Grace Sparks. Grace was also a big promoter uh, of tourism and, and of archaeology. Other uh, helpers on it were Malcolm Cummings, Byron's son, who uh, founded and became the director of the Smoke Eye Museum, now known as the Museum of Indigenous People. Earl Jackson was working at uh, Montezuma Castle National Monument at the time and showed uh, people around to the various archeological sites in the Verde Valley and helped them decide that Tuzigut would be the, the best site that they should excavate. So it began in October of 1933, uh, and during the course of, of time, the FERA was changed into the Civil Works Administration. But this will give you an idea of what a tremendous excavation undertaking this was with you know, tremendous amounts of, of Raw fall from the two-story tall Pueblo originally, uh, as well as you know, the fill you know, over the succeeding centuries. It was directed by um, Byron Cummings with the most of the work at, being done by Lewis Kaywood, Edward Spicer, Harry T. Getty, and Gordon C. Baldwin, all names you know, associated with the University of Arizona uh, and who went out after their graduations and made major contributions themselves. They hired a crew of 48 workers uh, composed of the local Yavapai Apache people, excavated 86 rooms and 415 burials. Uh, they also uh, built uh, a museum or visitor center uh, and trail facilities and housing for people. What was interesting at the time is that the laboratory work was done almost exclusively by local Hispanic women. Uh, who cleaned and reconstructed all the pottery vessels and other materials that came from the excavation work. 
You can see behind them, you know, all of the, the pottery vessels that were found, uh, not only just you know, glued back together again, but a lot of reconstruction work was done on them also. Of interest is the fact that uh, uh, the present day monument at, at Tuzigut still has a number of the original vessels that were excavated from the 1930s. And these are just various scenes showing the excavations and the stabilization at work. And this is the staff uh, of Yavapai Apache men uh, who did all of that hard work and labor. In the lower left corner, you can see uh, Getty, uh, Spicer, and Kaywood. And the name Tuzigut is an Apache word that means crooked water, named after the a bend in the Verde River uh, directly below the site. Uh, as I mentioned, they also were able to build a visitor center at the local museum, uh, done in, in typical southwestern archaeological uh, Pueblo style. Another major site that was excavated is Kanishpa, located on the Fort Apache Reservation. Uh, Byron Cummings uh, took charge of this one as his, his pet project for many, many years. Uh, he directed the excavations in 1931 to 1937 and used it as a training school you know, for students from the University of Arizona. And many of the, these people uh, turned into uh, very important uh, uh, archaeologists in the Southwest and in Arizona. Um, but one of the main things we think uh, he had in mind was he wanted to develop a, a major site uh, that he could be associated with and developed for public interpretation. The workers were paid $1.50 an hour a day, again, but almost you know, less than $30 today, uh, through the Bureau, Bureau of Indian Affairs you know, Indian CCC group. They built a museum, which was also uh, used as a, a residence for Cummings and uh, other people when they were working at the archaeological site. And as part of his grand scheme, Cummings wanted Kanishma to become a national monument. Um, he was never successful at that, although he made several efforts and the Park Service looked into the matter. Uh, but unfortunately, he died before it was finally designated as a National Historic Landmark in 1964. The Museum of Northern Arizona you know, took tremendous advantage of the funding provided by the, the New Deal program to uh, excavate a number of archaeological sites which led to the development of most of the uh, concepts of uh, Northern Arizona, uh, concepts of prehistory and cultural growth and development. As I mentioned, uh, he began his work in Flagstaff in 1916, where he took an immediate interest in prehistoric ceramics. Uh, he was one of the first you know, to you know, publish uh, the, the concept that what other people have called since then as the theory that pottery equals people. Uh, Dr. Colton noticed that different uh, Pueblo groups today make different kinds of pottery and rightly assumed that that went also back into prehistoric times. And so that became one of his major uh, interests you know, throughout his entire career was identifying, distinguishing, and, and describing different ceramic types in Northern Arizona. Uh, his typology is still the basic standard of work for, for most uh, archeologists who work in Northern Arizona. In 1928, you know, he uh, worked with a number of individuals to have the to found the Museum of Northern Arizona, or formerly the Northern Arizona Society of Science and Art. Uh, uh, he began, as I said, working you know, in, in the 1920s with excavation, and when the money provided by the New Deal programs uh, came about, he was able to immediately plunge into investigating the main sites that he knew would be important for understanding Northern Arizona prehistory. And this shows you a list of projects that the museum fu uh, funded at the time, those as well that were funded by you know, the New Deal programs, uh, and some of those undoubtedly you know, slopped over into, into one another. Probably the most important of those was, were the ones at Wupatki, Juniper Terrace, Winona Village, and Ridge Ruin. During that same time, you know, the museum participated in a major archeological expedition to Northern Arizona into the Kayenta country, 
the Rainbow Bridge Monument Valley Project, which did uh, definitive work uh, in the uh, Sagi Canyon area and Black Mesa area uh, that led again to important uh, concepts of uh, the Cayenta uh, Pueblo uh, culture. They also assisted work with the Park Service, uh, done in, being done at Tuzigut and Montezuma Castle, uh, and expanded their work to include uh, some excavations in the um, Win uh, Williams area to help define the uh, Kohonina cultural tradition. Many of the people who worked with him uh, during that time was Lynn Hargrave, uh, uh, Catherine Bartlett, and other 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 folks who were either students at the University of Arizona or uh, freshly uh, graduated from the university. Work began at Wupatki in the winter of 1933 and lasted into the, the spring of and summer of 1934. Uh, Dr. Colton directed it you know, primarily assisted by Lyndon Hargrave uh, and they were assisted with James Brewer who was worked for the Park Service at the time. Um, the museum had conducted earlier work at Wupatki in the late 1920s, working with A.E. Douglas, an astronomer from Tucson, who was developing the uh, science of tree ring dating at the time. And many, and Colton worked with uh, uh, Douglas uh, at Wupatki doing excavations to get uh, tree ring samples to help him you know, establish the Southwest chronology. Like many of the projects, when Pinkley had the funding available, he was he, he encouraged the, the recipients to hurry up and get the work done, uh, wanting to spend that money as soon as possible. So he was then work you know, to obtain additional funding to continue the, the archeological work uh, in the region. And that was a theme that's in, in many of his uh, letters to uh, the, the people at, at the different universities, was you know, get out there, produce it, hire the people, and, and get moving as soon as, as you can. Um, to mention, Jimmy Brewer was in charge of the, uh, uh, the monument uh, and helped with the excavation work, along with uh, Richard Van Valkenburg, who is, would become a longtime National Park Service archaeology, uh, and 15 laborers uh, recruited from the local community. Um, they basically you know, cleared most of the uh, rooms, uh, excavating a, a total of 32, uh, trenching in the deposits around the, the Pueblo, and as in other places, were able to build you know, walkways, uh, design signs, uh, as well as exhibits you know, for the, the museum. Uh, J.C. Fisher Motts was an architectural student uh, who worked at the museum that year and made uh, a number of maps from the archaeological surveys that they were going to do, as well as these reconstructions of the monument itself, of the uh, main site of Wupak. Again, the, the intent was, like many of these, was to provide uh, archaeological sites that would be available to the public you know, for recreational and educational purposes. Uh, and in the case of the Colton, so also you know, continue with the study of ceramics, looking at stratigraphic relationships of how they change through time. Uh, because work was done by unemployed men who had no archaeological training, and there was that constant pressure to produce you know, results, the work that was done was not carefully documented. Uh, and like most of the projects of, the, of that time, uh, the, no provisions were made for the analysis uh, and reporting or curation of the artifacts. Tuzigut was the lone uh, uh, example, however, that was able to obtain the funding and that report was published in the 1930s. Um, Dr. Colton worked very closely with the National Park Service in developing the interpretation of the site. Uh, and at, the, in this, at this period in time, the Park Service interpretive philosophy was to rebuild large chunks of the archaeological sites to give the people a better idea of what they would have looked like originally. Uh, in the 1950s, they changed that, that interpretation, that philosophical concept, and ended up in removing much of the work that was done in the 1930s. Um, and as you can see from the quote above, Dr. Colton was not very happy about that because 
two of the people that worked with Dr. Colton were Hopi uh, men from uh, the, the mesas, and uh, they spent quite a bit of time stabilizing the roofs and, and doing reconstructions of the Pueblos using Hopi style architecture. But after the Park Service pulled the roofs off, you know, as Dr. Colton notes, the weather destroyed pretty much all of the, the remaining tree, uh, dendro samples that were left in the site in, in, in situ. Uh, and this was his, his response to them in terms of what, they, what he, he thought of that change in philosophy. Now, much of the work that was done uh, in Northern Arizona was done out of a CCC camp that was located at the, at the base of Mount Eldon. Uh, the, the crew consisted mostly of, of young men from Pennsylvania uh, who worked over you know, the, much of the Northern part of the Southwest and the Flagstaff and Verde Valley uh, areas in particular. Keat Seal was another project uh, that was done in the late 1930s in the winter, winter time. Um, and as with the case of Upatki, uh, the money came from Pinkley saying, get, the, get your people out there as soon as possible and start working. Uh, again, people were paid uh, very low salaries, although it's uh, on a par of beginning salaries uh, today. Um, and the main people he helped hire him for work was John Weatherill, who was the custodian of Navajo National Monument and whose family had a long history in working in the Northern Southwest, as well as Erwin Haywind, Hayden and his son, Julian. They came directly to Keat Seal from Southern Arizona, where they had worked at the Gru site for the Southwest Museum. And Julian Hayden, in recounting that period of time, noted that being winter, uh, it was extremely cold up there and they were not prepared for the winter. Uh, just being you know, clothing from Southern Arizona. Uh, and they mentioned how they, they froze at night until one morning a group of Navajo came to sell them some sheep you know, for food. Uh, and uh, Irwin and Julian immediately latched onto two of the sheep uh, skins uh, to keep themselves warm at night and provide for their bedding. Again, photos of John Weatherill and, uh, and Milt Weatherill at the bottom and Julian at the top of the throat. Um, so Julian and, and Irwin did much of the mapping uh, and the note taking at the site. Uh, Julian did much of this, most of the stabilization work uh, using local materials. And uh, one of the major uh, projects that he had was to re reinsert a huge D D Douglas fir um, beam that, that lay in front of the site. And it wasn't until years later that he realized that he had put that in incorrectly and was very embarrassed about that. Um, but he did catalog you know, 1,000 of the artifacts, and it appears that there was an intention to publish a report on the site. Uh, and there is a manuscript report that Julian wrote uh, at the Museum of Northern Arizona Library, uh, but it never was, was published. Uh, that's another of many backlog reports from the Depression era sites that really should see the light of day. Again, Irwin's map of the site. And back at Flagstaff during the same period of time, the museum continued its work at uh, Nalakihu and the, in the Citadel area doing archeological surveys. Uh, Nalakihu is uh, about 10 miles from Wupatki National, from Wupatki site uh, and Although they had some gasoline uh, for transporting people back and forth to Flagstaff, uh, they didn't have enough uh, either gas or money in order to, you know, to commute daily from Flagstaff. And so they set up base camps at Wupatki and uh, in the latter part of the Wupatki excavations, they decided you know, to uh, work also at the site of Talakihu. The funding for that was originally slated to go for stabilization work at Walnut Canyon, but it was too cold that particular year. And so Colton uh, convinced Pinkley to allow him to take the money to fund work at Nalakihu instead. Uh, the 
And so as, in order to, again, minimize the transportation time and maximize work, they also set up a secondary camp at Nalakihu. At the same time, they also began expanding of the archaeological surveys that Colton had started back about 1918 uh, in, at the Wapatki area uh, to do some total archaeological survey work uh, in the northern part of the monument in the Citadel region. But at the site of the Lakihu, uh, they excavated uh, big, large chunks of it in the Pueblo itself and found uh, 15 very, very large pits, which were unusual at the time. Uh, as was the, the fact that there were six different uh, kinds of, well, six burials that showed different kinds of, of uh, funerary act, uh, this, uh, disposition, ranging from both extended inhumation, flexed inhumations, as well as cremations. Uh, uh, what what of special, was of special interest that a third of the pottery was all Prescott grayware, a pottery type made in the Prescott area. Uh, this prompted, you know, began uh, ideas that Colton would formalize shortly into you know, his concept of multiple different cultural groups moving to Flagstaff over time and forming a, a coalescence that led to the, the heyday of, of the prehistoric Sanawa. The survey uh, started out with five square miles, uh, recorded about 80 some odd sites. Uh, Dr. Colton and his assistant, Catherine Bartlett, also uh, did ar more archaeological survey in the area uh, for a grand total of 252 sites that were added. Uh, also, one thing that Colton was noted for uh, and that he promulgated uh, to all the people that worked at the museum was the importance of writing up the results of the excavation and survey work that they did. Uh, as he said, in a, 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 an issue of muse museum notes at the time, that research without provision for publication is a waste of time. It wasn't until the 1950s that Dale Stewart King was able to uh, get federal funding uh, as well as private donations as well to start a publication program to uh, print a number of the uh, early excavation reports, but only a small number of those that were, that were available ever actually came to fruition. Work also was done at the National Park Service Monument of Montezuma Castle down in the Verde Valley. It was directed by Earl Jackson and Sally Pierce, who later married uh, Jimmy Brewer, who we just met at Wupatki. Um, they used you know, 10 workers to remove the material that from Castle A. Montezuma Castle Monument consists of two large cliff dwellings, one that most people are familiar with known as the castle, and the other one, which was Castle A, which was a larger Pueblo, uh, largely built upon uh, scaffold, wooden scaffolding uh, in front of the, the, the cave itself. Uh, that was destroyed by fire and the entire uh, cliff dwelling collapsed into a mound of rubble. It had been pot hunted you know, for many years, um, but it was finally uh, totally removed and excavated out uh, as one of the, the major projects here at Montezuma Castle. They also constructed you know, many of the facilities, the road, the trails, a parking lot, you know, as, as well as housing. Um, the, also at the same time, um, the Harvey House you know, was very active in uh, promoting tourism in the Southwestern United States. Um, through the railroads and the Harvey, Harvey House system that accompanied them, they also gave you know, these luxury tours to the, the Northern Southwest. So people would get off in Winslow, uh, go into these specially produced uh, Ford touring station wagons to tour you know, the archeological and scenic sites you know, of the, the Northern part of the Southwest on their journeys you know, but to, to Los Angeles. What was interesting is Earl was a, a, a local boy uh, raised in the Verde Valley. Um, and the comments he had to make you know, during the uh, stabilization work was that you know, he was very proud of the work that the local Yavapai Apache workmen did. Uh, and as he says here, they would did much better work than uh, European Euro-American uh, skilled masons because they would have made things too nice and exact. Uh, so it was a more a, a 
a more authentic appearance to the sites uh, created by the Avapai Apache workers. To the east in petrified forest, now we had work done by the Museum of New Mexico, uh, primarily started by Harry P. Mera. Uh, as with Wupatki, they started out with large scale archeological surveys, uh, documenting 109 sites, uh, producing the description of one of the earliest brownwares in the area, Adamana Brown, uh, and excavating and stabilizing several of the sites you know, for, uh, for public visitation. Many of the concepts that you know, Mera developed uh, based upon this, the archeological survey work are still current in interpretations of uh, petrified forest area archeology. span Agate House is an interesting little site that's made of agatized uh, stone. But the main site that was worked on was the Puerco Ruin, a large late Pueblo III uh, plaza oriented structure uh, on the banks of the, of the Puerco River. It was later uh, excavated in more fully by Albert Schroeder for the Park Service in the 1950s, with additional work done in the 1960s by the Museum of Northern Arizona uh, by Calvin Jennings. But the real heyday for the museum and, and its work with the uh, C Duke CCC and WPA areas was work with the ball court sites of Winona Village, Juniper Terrace, and Ridge Ruin. Uh, the story on these is very interesting because people have known about these large oval depressions in the uh, Verde Valley for many years uh, and were suggested to be any number of things such as reservoirs or grain thresheries. But in 1935, when uh, a delegation of Mexican archeologists was uh, came to examine the work that uh, Howry was doing at Snake Town, they recognized these large depressions as being ball courts. When McGregor saw that, a light went off in his head because he knew that we had these kind of structures here in the Flagstaff area. And so when he got, got back to the Flagstaff and told Dr. Colton about it, they were both very excited and started uh, to uh, begin plans to excavate some of the ball courts we have here in the Flagstaff area. The first ones were that they tested were at the sites of Juniper Terrace, where they had worked a little bit earlier using students from Arizona State Teachers College, which is now known as NAU. Uh, they weren't able to you know, learn much from the first excavations. Uh, so they increased you know, their, their sample of the, of the ball court um, uh, using the WPA funding. As you can see, excavations weren't very pretty, but they did provide information, which was helpful when they moved on to the other sets of ball courts uh, in, in the area at Winona Village and Ridge Ruin. Winona Village uh, is located about 15 miles east of Flagstaff and consists of different clusters of pit, house, pit houses surrounded by trash mounds, uh, all focused around a central uh, ball court, which you see in the lower left of the slide. That tests were done uh, across the, the uh, trash mounds uh, and excavations within the structures themselves, following many of the, the same techniques uh, that were being used uh, at Snake Town by Gila Pueblo. Um, they found uh, a lot of variation in the pit house architecture, as you can see. Um, many of them uh, were, were fairly deep. Many of them had antechambers or entrance features of some sort. Uh, but again, a diversity of art roof styles and structures. Uh, John C. McGregor was in charge of it with again, Milton Weatherill acting as the assistant. Um, rotating their crews you know, every two weeks. And if you can imagine having new crews coming on of 15 people uh, every two weeks made things a, a little bit frantic excavation and documentation wise. Um, but nonetheless, the excavations were fairly well documented, uh, especially by the standards of the 1930s. Um, as you can see that they uh, did a number of, uh, tested a number of trash mounds and 18 pit houses and found 57 burials for it. Excavations in the uh, crash mounds were desired 
looking for stratigraphic relationships between uh, the different pottery types that were being identified in the area during the excavations. Again, some side uh, slides of Winona Village under excavation, a very deep uh, pit out on the left uh, and trenching through one of the ball courts on the right. The Fresno, the uh, horse-drawn plow in the upper left, was used to totally clear the ball court, uh, which was then the first you know, fully excavated ball court in Northern Arizona. Uh, unfortunately, it has since been destroyed primarily due to unauthorized bulldozer work uh, done by one of the local uh, uh, mining companies, we believe. Um, however, we, from looking at uh, excavation or aerial, aerial photographs of the area, it looks like the floor of the ball court may still exist uh, because we can see a dark green spot where vegetation uh, is much lusher because something is retaining the water and we believe that to be the, uh, the floor of the ball court. Uh, for exhibits at the museum at the time, uh, Colton uh, had a number of models made, both of pit houses, uh, Naakihu, as well as the ball court, and that's what you see in the, in the lower right. They found that there were about three major uh, construction episodes to the ball court, shown by the different uh, lines in the drawing on the, on the left. The ball courts were found to have a central feature uh, in the middle and uh, some sort of constructions at both ends of the, the sites. What was most interesting at the time is that one of the structures at one of the sites in the Winona Village complex very closely resembled uh, Hohokam style pit houses, such as the uh, how we at Gladwin were finding down at Snake Town. Mounds are also characteristic for the uh, Hohokam, as are ball courts. In addition to finding these architectural similarities to the Hohokam area, they were also finding artifacts that were reminiscent of those uh, found in the flood in the Hohokam area, such as red and buff pottery made out of local materials, vessel shapes such as the Gila shoulder jar in the upper right, and various types of shell jewelry, uh, very uh, indicative of, of, again, of the Hohokam. From this, you know, Colton developed a model that's called, that's called the black sand model. Um, Adding to this was the architectural variability that was noted at the pit houses in uh, at Winona Village, which suggested McGregor uh, influences from the Mugion area. Altogether, uh, Colden formulated the Black Sand Model, which basically postulates that with the eruptions of, suns of Sunset Crater in the, the late 1060s, 1080s, that the Black Volcanic Mulch acted as a uh, moisture re retaining uh, uh, medium that facilitated the growing of crops and that this precipitated a prehistoric land rush to the area that uh, resulted in cultural interaction that led to the later developments of the Kanawha. The concept has held for many, many years. Uh, it has been questioned by a few archaeologists, but it still is the major interpretive uh, format for uh, explaining the developments of the Flagstaff area although others of us disagree. But at Winona Village, they were able to improve methods that had been used earlier, uh, again, building off of the work that was done at Snake. And as I mentioned, that in search for stratigraphic relationships between the various planewares, they excavated uh, several trash mounds in the same technique that was used at, at, uh, at Snake Town. And they were able to return, uh, identify uh, is that the sunset cinder tempered pottery known as sunset plain sunset red occurred later in time than the uh, other types of Rio de Flag brown uh, and Winona brown. So that began again uh, starting out you know, refining the ceramic sequences of the Flagstaff area. Okay. Uh, shortly thereafter they continued excavations at the site of Ridgeland with McGregor in charge and again with Milk Weatherill helping him. Ridge Ruin is uh, about five miles east of Winona Village and also consists of scattered uh, groupings 
of uh, trash mounds surrounded by other pit houses. Uh, near the middle of the, it's located on the east edge of a, a large lava flow from Winona, Winona Cinder Cone. Uh, and it's uh, along the east edge that we see the scattered structures and, and trash mounds, all focused around a large uh, walled uh, site known as Ridge Ruin itself, which sits on a prominent hill in the middle of it all. The pit house clusters date to the 1070 to uh, 1130, 1150 period, just same time as Winona Village. And it then looks like many of those uh, scattered communities uh, came together uh, into the, the, the main site of Ridge Ruin itself. As I mentioned, Ridge Ruin is unique in having two separate ball courts, uh, both of which were tested. Um, they also excavated 19 rooms in the Pueblo of Ridge Ruin, uh, as well as 63 burials that were also excavated. Uh, again, the six pit houses showed similar kinds of architectural diversity you know, as those that were, were done at Winona Village. Um, Ridge Ruin has a very unique uh, configuration to it. Uh, and it is an example of what uh, some of us think uh, is examples of stratified uh, society in late Sanawa. Uh, it, a number, a small number of sites in the Flagstaff area have the same kind of uh, structure pattern uh, that uh, makes us suggest that they are you know, primary sites in the area. They're all located on hilltops. They have a higher quantity of intrusive uh, materials than other sites do in the area. They're located near a, a presumed prehistoric trade route of some sort. They have ball courts associated with them, large uh, uh, communal structures called community rooms. Uh, they are surrounded by inner and outer uh, courtyard walls. And these, uh, these sites have all these characteristics in common. It's a pattern that begins uh, seen in lesser form at Winona Village, fully developed at Ridge Ruin and continuing on until later sites on, uh, so, such as Rupatki, uh, Chavez Pass uh, and Juniper Terrace. The masonry at the site uh, is composed both of flat uh, forming sandstone slabs as well as the more irregularly shaped uh, basalt boulders. The lower stories were mostly uh, coarse sandstone. And it's been suggested on the basis of the chinking that was present in them uh, that Chacoan influence may be present. Uh, that again is a controversial subject uh, that uh, some people disagree with, um, but it is still floating around. One of the burials is extremely unusual. Uh, it was found in the center of a single room at the uh, end of the Pueblo, here shown as room one. And the story that uh, has been passed on through the oral history of the area is that the crew had finished their uh, excavation that McGregor and Weatherill had, had in mind, but there were still about two days left and they had a choice to make. Do they you know, call it quits and send the crew home or do they you know, continue to excavate? And they decided to continue excavating because they know that these, these families you know, were very poor and they very much depended upon them, the money that the, the CCC boys would send back home, which was also one of the requirements. Um, and so they decided to dig just one more room. And so they picked what they thought would be the fastest and easiest one because it was only one story tall, and that was room one. And in the center of it, they found a large pit about eight feet wide by four feet, uh, or eight feet long, four feet wide, uh, that was full of tremendous numbers of artifacts. Uh, in, in it was the burial of an adult man. Uh, near his head was a cap made of 3,600 shell uh, and, uh, and mineralized uh, beads, as well as a pointed wooden uh, point to the top of it. This, the pointed cap like that, is noted uh, as a symbol for the twin war gods of, of Hopi. And Hopi have identified him as a war society leader, the Kaleitaka. 
There are over 600 unique artifacts buried with him, including 25 pottery vessels, eight baskets, three of which were painted. And there's only about a dozen painted uh, baskets in the Southwest, over 420 projectile points, uh, much shell jewelry, much turquoise, a carved wooden cup inlaid with turquoise and, and uh, I'm sorry, a basketry bogard made of turquoise and porcupine teeth, a carved and painted wooden cup, uh, turquoise and pyrite inlaid a flying bird figure, staff, and the most unusual grouping of all were three sets of carved and painted wooden wands made of ironwood, which comes from the Phoenix Basin area. The three sets uh, were composed of three designed elements each, consisting of a handprint, an antelope, a deer hoof, and a curvy, curvy uh, design th thought that might be a, 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 an, an agave leaf. Um, when shown the objects, oh, well, because the excavation was in its last days, the weather was really bad. And the other whole oral history story tells us that McGregor was cleaning up room one uh, late one afternoon after the crew had left and noticed you know, the, uh, the floor was cracked in the center, which led him to dig a little bit of it and realize there was a large pit. He then called Greg on the phone, saying that he had to come out here and see this. Uh, and when uh, they, they did, McGregor realized that this was going to take you know, a lot of work to excavate. The weather was falling apart. They were worried to death that they were going to have either severe rainstorms or snow hitting. It was very cold. And so the excavation was done rather hastily uh, with very few notes. And they really didn't realize what they had found until they un unbagged it all in the lab. And as they spread it out, they were amazed at the material that was present. They also uh, uh, showed it to the two Hopi that worked at the museum. Uh, and they immediately recognized the materials. As they began talking to each other about it, so our oral history goes, McGregor put an object from the, 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 the artifacts in his pocket. Uh, and the two, and McGregor said, so you guys recognize this? And they said, yes, this is the uh, paraphernalia of a war society leader. And this was used in this way. This artifact was used like this, but there's something missing that there should be this. Uh, and it was the object that McGregor put in his pocket. So this, I think, you know, indicates very nicely the continuity uh, of, uh, of belief systems between prehistoric Sanawa as well as the modern Hopi and Zuni. And the Hopi men also indicated that the ceremony that was used with the stick was still done by the Zuni at the turn of the century, although it had died out before that at Hopi. Uh, Michael O'Hara, uh, who is now the state lands archaeologist, has written an excellent uh, PhD that focuses in part upon the function of the magician in Pueblo society. And he basically has concluded that the magician was the leader of not just one, but many uh, curing uh, medicine and war societies, all geared towards weather control, uh, curing illnesses, combating witchcraft, uh, warfare, ensuring hunting, uh, astronomical knowledge. And so an extremely important individual uh, and certainly one of the uh, earliest indications of these kinds of, of societal organizations you know, in the Southwest. Work was done at Walnut Canyon, uh, de developing a lot of the facilities for it. Uh, they constructed the Island Trail that uh, one, that long step uh, system that leads you down into the, the canyon, into the, the little cliff dwellings along. Uh, rails for it, the visitor center. Um, many of the buildings at the CCC work camp after the camp was abandoned were brought over and moved down the canyon and used there. Uh, and as I mentioned, that many of the, the men who were uh, worked there were all from Pennsylvania and they had never been out to the wild and woolly west before. And so that they 
reported back home that they were excited with the canyon and said had wild horses and rattlesnakes peeping out from all their trees. So, uh, Pat Stein has done a very interesting uh, oral history interview of a number of the CCC enrollees uh, that were at the Walnut Canyon. Uh, and that's where these, these stories come from. So if we look at all of these programs in total, um, what is the legacy that the New Deal uh, ex excavation have resulted in uh, to Southwest archaeology? One of the important things was it provided jobs for thousands and thousands of people at a time when you know, uh, work was desperately needed. Um, one of the interesting side lights that I mentioned earlier was the um, reasons why the magician's burial was excavated in the Hastings. And in 1987, uh, John McGregor did, was interviewed and was asked, you know, how, was he very excited about you know, the, the magician's burial materials? And he said, you know, well, not really, that wasn't our focus. Um, we were really worried about the weather and finishing. But also, we went up to finish it. Uh, with that changing every two weeks. And during the Depression, money was scarce. Uh, and they were worried that the workers might you know, grab artifacts just to, to, uh, to, to sell them on the black market just for a few pennies. And so I, I found his last remarks very interesting. So naturally, we didn't trust any of them. If they could walk off to something that they might turn into a few extra cents, they would. And I don't blame them. Again, another insight into what conditions were like back during the Depression years. But much of the work that was done, as I mentioned earlier at the start, was oriented towards tourism, promoting tourism uh, and archaeological sites for people to see. And of course, that legacy is still with us today. Uh, and all of these monuments are well visited. Uh, to my tourists today from all over the world. The visitor center you know, were, were built along the canyon, feasible to the Montezuma camp uh, to provide no showcases uh, for the archaeological materials at Canton. Publication, I mentioned uh, only a very few came out during the 1930s and 1940s, but with the Southwestern Monuments was. Uh, was published, was more founded. Many of those reports were pulled out of manuscript forms and published by Dr. Um, that was discontinued uh, a number of years ago. Now known as it also diversified the field, uh, including you know, people that were fairly due to archaeology, uh, including Native Americans, such as Jimmy Kewanwikua. Uh, Edmund Nakwatawa, uh, who were, worked in both at Wupatki uh, and, uh, as I mentioned, were the informant on the uh, magician material. Both of them were very important people and religious society leaders uh, up at home. It introduced many women into the field, uh, especially here in northern Arizona, Captain Bartlett, who came to the museum in, in the 19, early 1930s from school at the University of Denver and stayed with me to the museum her entire career, uh, starting uh, as a field associate, then as curator of collections. Finally, in her later years, she became the head librarian uh, and stayed with the museum until she retired. Mary Russell Farrell Colton, Dr. Colton's wife, was a very famous artist in her own right, uh, was very keen on promoting art uh, and promoting the the union of art with science uh, to, and developed many educational programs and uh, uh, techniques to expose you know, people to, and children especially, to archaeology. Irene Vickery, again, one of Cummings' students who also excavated at, uh, at, uh, at the site, um, also took, uh, was in charge of the excavations at in Globe. Sally Brewer, who later married uh, into the. Peter, I'm going to interrupt for a second. Um, you're turning away from the mic and it's really hard to hear. Okay. Thanks. Uh, all right. Okay. 
Sally Brewer uh, later married uh, Jimmy uh, to become uh, what, some more archaeologists in the Park Service. Florence Hawley uh, in New Mexico uh, excavated many sites, was important also in helping define New Mexico pottery types. Bertha Dutton also uh, excavated a number of sites, especially the earlier contact period sites in New Mexico. Improved field techniques in terms of mapping, such as those done by the museum, uh, by the architect. Uh, the excavation of stratigraphic blocks uh, initiated at Gila Pueblo at Snake Town that the museum then followed. Okay. Improved dating. Uh, many of the, uh, the tree ring samples collected in the 1930s that formed the basis for the Southwest tree ring chronology were recovered from uh, sites like Wupatki uh, uh, and uh, indications for that, uh, much uh, Hulk Colt worked closely with the Douglas in gathering the, the samples for it. And the first tree ring dating conference where Douglas began describing his, the technique and how it works was held at the Museum of Northern Arizona in 1934. It led to improvements in the classification of ceramics uh, led primarily by the Museum of Northern Arizona and the work of McGregor uh, and uh, Hargrave and Colton. Theoretical concepts were also improved. Uh, in Pecos in 1927, some of the initial concepts and theoretical underpinnings for ideas about the developments of Southwest archeology span were developed. And many of those were tested and improved and changed during the excavation work that was done in the 1930s. Some of the publications from that time uh, were important in that they organized, they provided the organizational concepts that archeologists used to understand and explain prehistoric cultures and the developments. Uh, this was all done around the same time by primarily Gladwin and Colton here in the Southwest and Will McKern back in, in the Midwest. Uh, Gladwin you know, developed in, and improved upon McKern, or, I'm sorry, Gladwin system is the one primarily used today. Uh, and McKern system was in part adopted by Colton, who then later uh, changed some of his concepts for it uh, into uh, coming in a closer and closer mesh with the, the Gladwin uh, system. Uh, one of the publications from this time that is a Southwest classic that I would encourage all Southwesterners to read if they haven't looked at it, was published by Colton in 1939 called Prehistoric Culture Units and Their Relationships in Northern Arizona. Uh, this was, uh, Colton was charged to do this in 1931 uh, as, as a result of the, uh, the Gila Pueblo Conference held at Gila Pueblo Globe by Harold S. Gladwin. Gladwin and Colton realized that the uh, PECO system worked fine for the, uh, the Pueblo world, but it didn't really fit well in central or southern Arizona. And so Gladwin called the conference in 31 uh, and charged Colton to uh, define the prehistoric cultures in Northern Arizona, and he would do the one for Southern Arizona. Well, Colton got sidetracked and decided that he couldn't really define the uh, Northern Arizona cultures without knowing the pottery first. And so he turned his focus to ceramics. But by 1939, he had what he felt was sufficient evidence and so developed you know, the, uh, the bulletin, uh, which is very important. Uh, and if you ever wanted to know why different cultures have these different names, how certain phases were named, uh, that's all contained in here because Colton named the cultures and phases after local places and sites. The, in also by looking, by looking at uh, Colton's 1939 report, you have a good idea of how they conceptualize cultures and the relationships of artifacts to people and cultural groups at the time. Many of the famous archeologists of the uh, 40s, 1950s and early 60s were also trained in these uh, very vitally important uh, projects of the past, such as Walter W. w. Taylor, who worked at the Baker Ranch site for the Museum of Northern Arizona, Getty Spicer and Curtis, uh, at Tusigut, uh, and of course, Julian Hayden at any number of sites excavated by both Gila Pueblo as well as the Museum of Northern Arizona. 
And as I mentioned, this set the stage for continuing research, following up on the ideas and theories and concepts developed during this period of time. Although John McGregor left the museum to teach at the University of Illinois, he did come back uh, periodically for a number of years. Uh, he fo focused many of his work on the, the areas peripheral to Flagstaff, such as the Kohonina area around Williams uh, and the Anderson Mesa region south of Flagstaff. His work done in the, by, by two or three expeditions in the 1950s is to still today just about the only work that has yet been done in the Anderson Mesa area. It's a virtually unexplored area uh, to the, the main center of the Flagstaff area uh, and is just waiting for additional work to be done. The data, of course, that was produced ha has been available and has been used for decades of study and knowledge to contribute new ideas uh, to uh, Southwest archaeology. Uh, and again, you know, the uh, legacy that we all have today in the Southwest uh, is directly due in, in part to the work that all these people have done uh, during those uh, seminal period of the depression years uh, of the 1930s to early 40s. So thank you. Are there any questions? Thanks, Peter. Um, did you want to stop your screen share? Yes. Okay. Those of you out there, if you have questions, feel um, feel free to put those in the Q&A. Um, I do have a couple, but go ahead and put those in now and we'll ask Peter. See some hand clapping coming up. Peter, it's the, it should be a red button that says stop share. I know there should be. Should be toward the bottom of the screen when you put your cursor down there maybe. Otherwise we can just leave it up and go ahead yep. and talk this way. Um, so thank you. Uh, very interesting to see all those old photographs, first of all. Um, and Arkenhis does a lot of presentations on prehistoric. So it's interesting to see the historic perspective as well as the prehistoric in this presentation. So thank you for that. There you go. Now I see you. Um, so I do have a question related to that. Has, you know, there were quite a few burials in, in what you talked about and have those been repatriated? Have the human remains and funerary objects been repatriated? Yes. Um, the, the Museum of Northern Arizona cooperated with the Coconino National Forest for a five year period of time, working uh, with the Pueblo of, of Zuni uh, and the Hopi Mesas to uh, uh, redocument all burial material that was recovered from the from the forest over the decades. Uh, we had material sent back to Flagstaff for processing from the American Museum of Natural History, the University of Utah, UCLA, uh, University of Arizona, Arizona State, the Peabody Museum, the Smithsonian, you name it, material from the Flagstaff area was all over the country. All of that was returned. All of it was consistently analyzed photographed, documented by the same uh, experts in ceramics, artifacts, physical anthropology, uh, and over a five-year period were reinterred in several locations, uh, selected and approved by the Hopi tribe in the Pueblo of Zuni. Uh, so all of those materials uh, are now back in the earth. Thank you. Uh, was road building a big part of the CCC effort? Um, I would say not to the extent that it was in Southern Arizona. Uh, we did have some, but it was focused up here primarily on access to the national monuments and improving, improving the facilities as well as the roads there. Yeah, we did see some uh, tourist car down at the bottom, uh, right? Uh, yeah. Were there like, roads in there or were they just going cross country? No, that was part of the Harvey House tour of, of the Northern Southwest. Okay. You mentioned it was a, a a specific program that they sponsored uh, and was very, very successful. Good. 
All right, any other questions out there? I don't see any others on the screen. Anybody else? Questions for Peter? I don't see any. Waiting a couple of couple minutes, a minute or so. Um, do you have any other comments you'd like to make, Peter? Well, if you haven't heard yet, the Pecos Conference is being held in Flagstaff this year, uh, and there'll be a number of tours you know, being conducted on Sunday at the end of the the main part of the conference. I'll be taking uh, a group probably out to the Anderson Mesa area to see some of the McGregor sites. Uh, there will be a tour looking uh, out to the Kohanina area to look at some of the Kohanina sites that McGregor worked on. Um, and so people should avail themselves of that opportunity. Great, good. I see another question here. Um, by the time ball courts appear in Sanagua, they're fading out at Hohokam areas. What's your take on that? Well, just because they're fading down south doesn't mean they have to be fading up here also. Um, I think the, the ball courts are part of, uh, obviously, extensions of influence from the Hohokam area. Uh, and just as it takes longer for those kinds of things to appear in an area, similarly that they take longer before they disappear. Um, there's, there is some controversy in terms of how long ball courts last up here. Uh, people who have worked in the Hohokam country basically say that they're pretty much gone by 1150. And so some of the ones that we have up here can't be that late. Uh, others of us would point to the associations of certainly a ball court like uh, feature at the, the sites of Chavez Pass. Uh, another one is near the base of Old Caves Crater, which is our sole you know, early P4 site in the Flagstaff area. Um, unfortunately, it can't be dated and has not been tested or excavated. Uh, but their close association with these main centers, as they have been from early on, uh, to me, you know, suggests very strongly that they do late, uh, do they do date late, you know, later than they do in, in, in the Hohokam core area. Thank you. Um, another one uh, that there were, you talked about the difference in, in payments for the unskilled and skilled workers. Who were the skilled workers? They would be like masons and carpenters. Okay. You know, people who were already craftsmen in their own, own realm. realm. Because remember, another part of the CCC WPA programs was to train people in, in different uh, crafts and, 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 uh, and jobs uh, to, so that they would find employment and be able to you know, get jobs once the, they were out of the CCC and the WPA. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. All right, I don't see any more questions. I have just a comment here that says, thank you so much. Enjoyed the talk and the slides. Yes, the, the those historic photos are precious. Sure. Um, and they teach us a lot about how it was done in those days, right? And mm -hmm. and the difference in how we do things now, hopefully. Right. Um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, anyway, thank you everyone for being there. Uh, if you have if you have comments in the chat, Peter will receive those when I send him the the list from from the chat. And um, thank you for being here. And hope to see you again next month for. Uh, for Thatcher, Thatcher Seltzer Rogers presentation. So thank you, Peter, and have a good evening, everyone. Good night.